Welcome to the Liberty Baptist Sermon Archives. The message you're about to hear was preached at Liberty Baptist Church in Easton, Massachusetts. You can find out more about us or contact us at mylibertybaptist.org or just look us up on Facebook. And now we hope that this message from God's Word will be a blessing to you. Amen. All right. I'll try this one more time and you can turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter number three. This evening, as you know, we are not going to the book of Revelation just yet. I'm just seeking the Lord on the timing of that. It may be at the beginning of the year. I'm not sure exactly uh, when that will be yet, but we're going to give ourselves a little bit of time uh, between the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation just to look at a few different things uh, as the Lord leads. And so tonight we will be in Genesis chapter number three uh, for our message. And of course, if you have uh, your prayer bulletin, you'll see on the back of that prayer bulletin that the title of this message is this. Where should I be? Where should I be? And of course, that uh, title comes from what we see here in Genesis chapter number three. Can you imagine Adam and Eve living? Yeah, that's not going to work. All right. So, well, we learned another lesson about that tonight, and that's okay. We could plug it in, but I think we've survived for nine years without that. I think we'll be fine. All right. Uh, But uh, uh, could you imagine Adam and Eve living in perfect harmony with the Lord in the garden? I mean, I don't think our minds can even comprehend as much as your and my mind can't comprehend what heaven will be like, the joys of heaven, the perfection that is heaven, the fellowship unbroken that we will have with the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. We can't even imagine what that would be like. In the same way, I feel like we can't truly imagine what it would have been like in the garden because even this earth at its best, even if you were to look at the beauty of this earth and some of the most wonderful locations that we have here on earth, and there are many of those, it is still spoiled by the curse of sin. Uh, But can you imagine the Garden of Eden unspoiled uh, from sin, Uh, perfect fellowship between God and man, between man uh, and the animal kingdom, with the animal kingdom and each other, knowing that the lion would sleep with the lamb, uh, knowing that there would be no carnivorous animals in the way that there are today, unbroken, perfect fellowship. Our minds can't even comprehend it, but that is where Adam and Eve were in the garden, which makes this text that we're about to read so sad because it is the time that Adam and Eve were not to be found by the Father. Now, of course, you know when I say that, God knew exactly where they were. God has never been in the business of not being able to find his own children. Uh, God knows where we are, when we are, uh, who we are. He knows the hairs on your head, uh, and he knows where those hairs are uh, in this earth. He knows where you are and all of these different things. But to, for Adam and Eve to enjoy that unbroken fellowship, then for it to be spoiled by sin, and for God to not be able to find them. And again, understanding what that means, not that he couldn't, but that they were trying, attempting to conceal themselves from God himself. What a sad, sad spectacle that is. And it reminds me tonight that uh, as we look at some of these questions, where should I be as Adam and Eve were not where they should have been, uh, we're going to ask ourselves some questions tonight and consider some things. For instance, have we grown as we should? Have there been some things that have hindered us from being all that we should be? Just as Adam and Eve may not have felt that, well, they weren't what they should have been before their father. Uh, if we were to stand before our father tonight, and remember, he could call us at any time, whether he calls us home uh, through uh, passing in this life or whether he calls us all home that know him as Savior because the last trumpet sounds, uh, whatever it may be, if we were to stand before God uh, tonight, you say, well, pastor, that's not going to happen. Well, Jesus said, it's just about the time when people say that, that that's when it's going to happen. So we know that the return of Christ is imminent, that it could happen at any time. But if we were to stand before uh, Jesus Christ tonight, would we try to conceal ourselves uh, just as Adam and Eve tried to adjust those fig leaves, trying to make sure uh, that they weren't uh, seen before the Father? Or or would we be able to stand before him, not boldly necessarily, but humbly and and with the understanding that we have done what we could uh, before the Lord? And so I want us to just kind of ponder and to kind of consider these things here tonight. And so we're in Genesis chapter chapter number three, and you can remain seated, but we're going to begin reading in verse number eight. It says, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. What a sad, foolish attempt this is here in verse number eight. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? 
And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. There's so many things that we see in these three brief verses. The fact that they were willing to hide themselves. The fact that they have now broken fellowship with the father. The fact that when the father's voice uh, was, uh, was cast out through the garden, that instead of their hearts leaping for joy, as it had every other time they had heard the voice of the father, for the first time they have to admit, now I'm afraid. You see, there are times where we really enjoy the voice of the Father. It's a comfort uh, to be able to get into his word uh, and for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. But if we're not right with the Lord, uh, his words are not really what we want to look at. His Holy Spirit is not what we want to hear. And Adam and Eve are experiencing that here for the first time. But it's that question that it said here in verse number nine, where art thou? That I kind of want to take off on tonight for us to look at in our own lives and ask you the question, where art thou? You say, well, pastor, I'm right here. Can't you see me? And the answer is, yes, of course I can see you. And I'm here just as you are. But to ask yourself the question tonight, spiritually speaking, where are you? How are you doing? To be able to take a little bit of a check, to make an examination of ourselves as we are to do here and there uh, in our lives. And this is what we are to uh, consider here tonight. And in fact, as I look at our text here this evening, there are four questions along those lines I want us to consider here this evening when I think of this question, where should I be? And number one, as you see here on the television right here, uh, number one is this, where were you? Where were you? Anthony could see it. All right, good. Uh, Where were you? Do you remember the poverty of your soul before you got saved? Do you remember what your life was like before you got saved? Now, for some people, it might be a little bit different because if you got saved at a young age, uh, well, you were saved from getting into a lot of things, but maybe not necessarily saved out of certain types of sins. You know, if you're uh, five years old, you probably didn't get saved from, uh, you know, hard drinking uh, or drug use or uh, anything like that. At least I hope not. Uh, But you may have been saved from those things, no doubt. And by the way, both are miraculous. Uh, Both are the work of God and it shouldn't be uh, undone. In fact, sometimes I found that there are young people or people who got saved when they were young. It's almost like they're sorry that they got saved so young because they don't have this testimony of that they got saved out of those things. May I remind you tonight, if that's you, there's a lot of people who got saved in their 20s, their 30s, their 40s and beyond that would love to be able to have the testimony uh, that you have that they had got saved at, at a very young age because they know the things that they would have avoided if they had gotten saved when they were young. So never have a problem with that never uh, uh, think that's a sad thing that you don't have this amazing testimony well I was doing this and this and this and then God saved me no be glad that God got you when he got you that you open your heart to the Lord when you did but the question we start with tonight and we need to remind ourselves really before we get too far into the self-examination is where were you can I remind you what Psalm 40 verse 2 says he brought me up also out of an horrible pit out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Before we got saved, we were running in place. We weren't going anywhere. It was like we were stuck in quicksand. The more we tried to do things, the further deep we got into our problems. But what did God do? He brought us up out of the horrible pit. He brought us up out of the miry clay and he set our feet upon a rock. What does that mean? He put us on a firm foundation. And then established our goings. He didn't just put us on the solid rock, which is Jesus Christ. But then he moved us forward. He told us which way to go. Where before we had no direction. Now we have direction. Now we have purpose. Uh, Now we have true life. Real living through Jesus Christ. Psalm 58 verse 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born speaking lies. You say, oh, I don't believe that. You ever seen a baby? Who teaches a young child to lie? I never had to sit down with any of my four kids and say, listen, if you want to be dishonest and if you want to get out of trouble, here's what you need to do. You need to fabricate a story about something that didn't actually happen. And then when daddy or mommy ask you what happened, you tell us the story that's not true. Listen, they figured that out all on their own. And so did you. And so did I. Uh, You know why? Because we came out of the womb speaking lies. Uh, That's what God says. That's what we were before we got saved. Isaiah 118, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as wool. Uh, Again, reminding ourselves tonight that even our very righteousnesses, the things that we thought were the very best of us, were still tainted by sin. Before we got saved, even the very best of who we are was still tainted by sin itself. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep. How many? 
all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's not a surprise that God continually compares us to sheep. Why? Because sheep, as the preacher once said, sheep are stupid. Now that's not very nice. Little ones, you don't need to be talking like that. That bad talk from the pastor in the pulpit. He said stupid. Yes, I did. We'll edit it out. Maybe. But uh, sheep are dumb. Sheep don't listen. We're like sheep. That's why we need the good shepherd. The one who establishes our goings. The one uh, who is going to put us on the right path. And so sometimes I think we have to remind ourselves who we were. And, and, and that's an important thing. That's why the Bible says such were some of you. Because that is who we were. And listen, I was 16 years old when I got saved. And I wasn't into all the trouble that maybe some 16-year-olds were. But I could tell you this, I wasn't on the road to being a preacher. Uh, I wasn't on the road uh, to the straight and narrow. In fact, I was making a beeline uh, uh, to the wide path. I was trying to find all the things the world had. And I was looking at all the wrong places. Uh, I wasn't looking for the things of God. I wasn't looking to follow God's path. I wasn't into the Bible. I wasn't into uh, anything that was righteous. I was exactly opposite of that. And the only reason I didn't get into more trouble than I did was because I was too dumb to find out where the trouble was. But I was looking. And if someone would have showed me, I would have been there. But I'll tell you what, if that's not the protecting hand of God, even for me at a young age, uh, I'm so thankful. But even then, uh, I remember what I was. And as I look at myself as a 16 years old, 16 year old before December 2nd, 1998, I know this. There was nothing in me that deserved heaven. There was nothing in me that deserved a calling. There was nothing in me that deserved anything but a hell. But that's every one of our testimonies. That your testimony may not be like mine, but in the essence of it, it's exactly like mine. We were sinners that needed a savior. So the first question I is this, where, where were you? And I hope you remember the answer. By the way, if, if, you're still, if you're still living in that condition, you need to get saved tonight. You say, Pastor, but it's a Wednesday night. I mean, do you know who you're talking to tonight? Yeah, I'm talking to a bunch of people. That's who I'm talking to tonight. And I never make any assumption that just, well, everyone's saved uh, who's in a room tonight. I don't know that. Only the Lord knows that. So it bears repeating tonight that, yes, if you don't know Jesus Christ, your Savior, and you've been holding back or maybe you've been embarrassed or you say, well, everyone in the church thinks I'm saved already. Oh, what will they say? Well, I'll tell you what they'll say. Praise God that you got that taken care of, that Satan's hold upon you is now released and you're living in a new life. Where were you? Number one. Number two, there it is right there. Number two, where are you? Where are you? Isn't that the question that God asked Adam and Eve? Where are you? What we say, where are you at? You don't need the word at, but... Grammatically, it's not necessary, but it's something that people usually say. Where are you at? Where are you? Not where were you, but where are you? Now, that's a different question, isn't it? Let me ask you this. Do you give yourself time for contemplation about where you are in your spiritual life? Well, pastor, I'm going to church. Well, that's good. You could be a backslider going to church. Well, pastor, I, I read my Bible. Well, you could just be doing it out of habit. And not really doing it because the Lord is trying to speak to you. Can I tell you, there are times that I've read through my Bible and I've gotten through chapters of Scripture. And if you were to quiz me on what I just read afterwards, uh, all I was thinking about is what I got to do that day. All I was thinking about is the problems of yesterday or the problems of tomorrow. And I couldn't even tell you what I just read, but I could have checked off those boxes that I'd read those chapters that day uh, and I would have felt good about myself. And that's why, although those tools are good, they are not the end all be all. Uh, just because someone says, well, I've read the Bible through uh, 12 times in a year. Great. How many times the Bible read you? And again, I'm not mocking if someone does that. Praise the Lord if you're able to do that. But if you read through the Bible in a year, I hope that the Bible has been able to read through you in a year as well. And so what we have to do when we ask ourselves the question, where are you? Where are you spiritually tonight? We really can't answer that just at the snap of a finger. See, we need to take time to contemplate where we are. Do you take time to do that during your Bible reading? Not just so that you can get from point A to point B, so that you can enjoy the journey, so that God can teach you some things. I've told you before, I'm the kind of driver that I want to get from point A to point B. I don't want to see anything. I don't want to go on the side roads. I don't want to see what the, what, what, what the uh, monuments are. I don't want to see any of it. If it's supposed to take me 20 hours to get there, then I want to get there in 20 hours. 
Do what you have more fun in 24. But I'm supposed to be there in 20. That's the way we are. Chuck, am I telling the truth? Yeah. Yeah, until we sell Bucky's. That's right. All right. Well, dude, we, we don't need to confess those things right now, Chuck. All right. This is why I don't call on people in church. All right, good. You pick now to talk, Chuck. Thanks. All right. So, <laughs> he is right. <laughs> But I want to get to where I'm going. Some of you I could see from your faces, you kind of feel the same way. That's the way your family vacations are. Look, I want to get there in a hurry so I can relax. <laughs> but you know, sometimes I feel like I can do my Bible reading that way. I've got a certain amount of chapters I want to get through. I've got a book of the Bible I need to read. I've got to get it done. I've got to get that finished. Well, isn't it more important that maybe you let the Lord do the work he's trying to do in your heart? And maybe you can't say, well, I read an X amount of chapters, but you actually got something from the Lord during that time of Bible reading. Listen, if you have one verse work on you and you're working on that verse for a certain period of time and it consumes your Bible reading time for that day, if God spoke to you, you've got nothing to be embarrassed or ashamed about. Where are you at? Where are you? Allow God to do that in your life. Uh, allow God to have times of meditate or allow yourself to have times of meditation in your life where God can speak to you. Again, we don't need all the, the, the noise of the world. I've preached on this before. The idea that we have to have podcasts on and music on and the news on and the television on and the YouTube on and all these different things on all the time that we don't have time to meditate on the things of the Lord because everyone's telling us what to think. Everybody's telling us what to think, but we never allow the Holy Spirit to tell us what to think. Where are you at? You know what? A great time to discern where you are is during the preaching of God's word. As we listen to preaching, we need to develop and learn how to listen to preaching properly. You say, Pastor, you don't make that easy. Well, I mean, I don't know. I can't, I can't say for that for sure, but this is what I do know. Is that when I listen to preaching, I feel like usually by the second, third, like two-thirds of the way through, I'm listening to what's being said, but there's also an internal conversation that's going on at the same time. You know, when we're not just talking about the text, but we're making some application. I hear the preacher make an application, but I have the Holy Spirit make an application too. And so I have to start listening to that dialogue. It's not that I'm tuning out the pastor, but I have to listen to what the Holy Spirit wants for me. And maybe he says it's time to go forward to the altar. Maybe he says it's time to pray uh, at your seat. Uh, it's time to kneel before the Lord. Uh, but you have to be able to allow the Holy Spirit to say, where are you? Again, what a shame it would be to come to this, to this church 52 weeks out of the year, three services a week, that's over 150 sermons, but then to never actually hear anything. Could you imagine? What a shame that would be that you would listen to over a hundred hours of preaching, but never actually have the word penetrate your heart. You say, pastor, that couldn't happen. It happens every day at good Bible preaching churches. And if we're not careful, it can happen to you. And yes, it can happen to me too. So we have to ask ourselves, where are we at? This is why the, the, the psalmist said in Psalm 139, 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Where are are you not where were you you were a sinner and needing a savior but where are you today and where are you in your spiritual walk by the way that's not where the other guy is that's not where the other lady is it's where are you i found this to be true we are much better at discerning the spiritual needs of other people around us than we are in ourselves and i'm as guilty of this as anybody but what did the psalmist say search me Search me. What else was said by the psalmist? Vengeance is mine in reference to the Lord, saith the Lord. I will repay. Allow the Lord to be the Lord. Allow the Lord to take care of what the Lord can do. But ask yourself, where am I spiritually? Well, pastor, we've got a, a good group of people here. And we do. Can I tell you? I'm excited to see what the Lord's doing. You look at, looking around here on a Wednesday night. This is good. I don't know if you noticed, but there's people here. That's a blessing. Some of you weren't here on a Wednesday night six months ago. Some of you weren't here at all six months ago. It's a blessing. I'm glad that you're here. But it's not just enough to know that there are bodies and seats. I'm glad that you're here. I I'm not minimizing that at all, but I'm saying that if you think the end goal is just to be here, then you've missed the most important part is the time of self-reflection to be able to say, Lord, where am I? What am I doing? What am I doing for you? 
What do you want me to do for you? What should I not be doing? What should I be doing? And that I'm not just living out a list of do's and do nots and shout and shout nots, but rather I'm listening to the voice of the sweet Holy Spirit. And if my Lord and Savior, the one who loved me so much that he died on the cross for my sins, if that same Savior tells me that there's something in my life that needs to be corrected, then I need to be at the present point where I'm at, that if he says it, I'm going to do it. Well, it doesn't make sense. Well, have you read a lot of things in the Bible that didn't make sense? Hey, march around a city. For seven days. On the last day, march around seven times. It'll fall down. Listen to, the vo- listen to the breeze and the mulberry trees. And then when you hear it, attack. And you'll win. I mean, do we need to keep going? The word of God is filled with these things. Where are we? Where were you? Number two, where are you? Number three, where should you be? Where should you be? Okay, it's safe to say you're not necessarily exactly where you need to be by the way nobody's where they should be spiritually completely and totally until you get to heaven you're not going to be exactly where you need to be so we ask ourselves this next question where should i be listen to this an attempt to recruit john scully the 38 year old president of pepsi cola steve jobs the founder of apple computer issued a tremendous challenge to scully he asked him this do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugared water or do you want a chance to change the world Think about that for a second. Steve Jobs, in the early 80s, asked the CEO of Pepsi, by the way, the same man who started the Pepsi Challenge, which catapulted Pepsi to, at the time, being the number one soda in the United States, so much so that they thought that Coke needed to taste like Pepsi, so they made new Coke. John Scully was the one, at 38 years old, who spearheaded that. But Steve Jobs, when Apple was still very young and not the apple that we know it is today, uh, when it was still young, he said this, do you want to just sell sugared water the rest of your life? Or do you want to change the world? By the way, he decided to work with Apple. And they did, in many ways, change the world, didn't they? Not saying it's always for the best, but could we not say that that company changed the way we think of computers, changed the way that we think of electronics in general, Now, AirPlay doesn't seem to work very well, at least not our computer, but in general, it's changed a lot. But you know, that's a question we have to ask ourselves, isn't it? Do we just want to do the things of this world that's just as addictive, but just as empty as sugar water? Or do we want a chance to change the world? Where should we be? See, this is a challenge to all Christians. Are we settling for less than God's best in our lives? Are you allowing yourself to settle for less than God's best for your life? Everybody should be saved. Everybody should be growing in their faith. Everybody should be faithful. Everybody should be spiritual in the sense that they have the desire to do what God wants them to do. But I'm afraid so oftentimes is that the idea of where we should be, we're thinking about the next vacation or we're thinking about the next big purchase or we're thinking about the next election or we're thinking about the next the next, the next of the things of earth, but we think very little of the things of what would you have me to do, Lord? Where would you have me to go? What would you have me to sign up to do? Who would you have me to speak to uh, about salvation? Uh, how could I be uh, an ambassador for Christ? How could I be the hands and the feet of the gospel? How could I be the one that would do those things? Where should you be? I think to an extent, most of us already know we're not where we should be. And we know we need to grow. Where should we be? One of our church's first themes was that ye may grow. That ye may grow. It was important for us as a church. I think it was only the second or third year. Because we needed to grow. No, not just in numbers. Because I found it, in some ways, those very first few years, very easy to pull a crowd. We could have a big day, and because the church was new, we could pull in a crowd. But it wasn't just about growing in numbers. It was about growing ourselves. Where should you be? Have you even considered where you should be? Listen, if you're taking stock of where your stocks are, but not taking stock of where you are spiritually, you're missing the most important part. If you're taking stock of where you want to be in your employment 10 years from now, but you're not thinking about where you should be spiritually, you're missing the mark. 
if you're thinking about uh, how you're going to pay off those debts and when they are going to get paid off and can you pay them off quicker if you do the debt snowball or if you do this or you do that. And again, none of those things, I'm not saying they're not important. They're all important in their own ways. But when you put them before the things of God, before you put them before, where should I be, Lord, right now? You're missing the mark. Where were you? Where are you? Where should you be? And let me ask you this, where will you be? Where will you be? I think a lot of people know where they should be. They know they're not where they should be. But the question is this, what are you going to do about it? What will you do about it? Will we just be the common Christian that's willing to be watered down, that's willing to be worldly, that's willing to be weak and make no difference in this world today. The kind of Christian that Satan is not only not afraid of, the kind of Christian that Satan relishes because it actually makes it harder for the unsaved to get saved when they see weak believers who don't actually say they believe what they believe. Satan loves that. Where will you be? Will you be saved if you're not? Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're not saved tonight, where will you be? Can I ask you, where will you be if you die tonight? But it's not just being saved, it's also serving. Will you serve? Proverbs 16, 20, he that handleth a matter wisely shall, be, shall find good, and whoso trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. To, to handle life wisely to serve as God would call us to serve. I, I keep going back to a, a book that I was reading just a, a few weeks ago, uh, and it was just such a, a stark reminder of John chapter number 13, when you talk about service, and here is Jesus who girded himself about with a towel. And it says in John 13 chapter one, that when he's talking to these disciples, and, he said, and, and John puts it this way, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, whom he loved until the end. I mean, those guys? Love them to the end? I mean, he knew they were about to all run and tuck tail in about a few hours, with the exception of John. He knew one of them was about to betray him. But the Bible says he girded himself about with a towel when none of the other 12 would do so. None of the other 12 wanted to wash anyone's feet, as was the custom during that time. You're out in dusty roads. You come into this upper room. You're about to have a meal. And remember, we talked about this with John, the way they sat at those times. They kind of reclined at the table. So your feet would be near the table. You wanted to have clean feet. Someone should have cleaned the feet. Someone should have done that, that duty. And by the way, aren't you glad churches don't do that today? Thank the Lord. But I'm just saying in general, the idea is here, is that Jesus was willing to do what no one else was willing to do. Even though he had the cross before him, he was still willing to be a servant. We're... Where will you be? Well, I should be a servant. No, no, where will you be? Not that you should be a servant. Will you be a servant? If Jesus Christ made that a priority in his final hours, then why can't we make it our priority when it's seemingly that we have our whole lives ahead of us? Where will you be? Will you, will you be saved if you're not saved tonight? Will you serve if you're not served tonight? I saw this recently. I thought this was so good when it comes to service. There are three types of Christians who respond to the call of service. There are three types of Christians who respond to the call of service. First, there are rowboat Christians. They have to be pushed. Second, there are sailboat Christians. They always go with the wind. And third, there are steamboat Christians. They make up their minds where they ought to go, and they go regardless of the wind and the weather. You know, we don't need more fair weather servants. We don't need more fair weather believers. What we need are those who have uh, the fortitude, not within them own, their own selves, but that can only come from the Holy Spirit of God, that we will go where he wants us to go. And even when the headwinds in this world is against us, and by the way, it is. And in many ways, it feels like it's gale force against us right now. But when we have the power of God within us, greater is he that was in us than than he that is in this world. And if we have what God has put inside of us, that Holy Spirit of God, and we tap into that power that he's put within us, we can serve not as a rowboat, not as a sailboat, but as a steamboat to go. And we can be who God wants us to be. So here's the question. Where should you be tonight? Where should you be tonight? 
not where you were. I think we know the answer to that, but it's good to be reminded. Not where you are, although you have to diagnose that for yourself. Where you should be. But really it comes down to this, where will you be? Because we can be coulda, woulda, shoulda Christians that we get to the end of our life and think, oh, think of all I could have done. And if I had put half of the time into Christian service that I did into YouTube or onto social media or onto the latest television series, just think of what I could have done for Christ. I was thinking about this just a few days ago, Brother Vince. At the end of my life, I'm not going to think, boy, I wished I had watched more YouTube. I just, I didn't watch enough cat videos, you know? I just wanted to see more of those cat videos, and I did not see enough of them. The algorithm said, but another one, and another one, and another one. But I just, I, I resisted it, and I wished I hadn't resisted it. I wanted to watch more. But I'll tell you what I can think of at the end of my life. There's someone I wished I had reached. There's something I wished I had done that I knew God had told me to do. See, because the excuses we make now that make so much sense won't make sense then. The things that seem so sensible now will seem senseless then. Not just at the end of our life, but imagine at the judgment seat of Christ where all of our works will go before him. And it's not wood, hay, and stubble that we want. It's gold and silver and precious stone that we desire. Why? As I've said before, so that we can cast it back at the feet of Jesus. So what do we do? Where should we be? One, here's, a, here, here's, here's just some very brief reminders for you and helps for you tonight. Some practical ways to be where we should be. One, put your eyes on the Lord. Put your eyes on him. Luke 12, 34. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. John 12, 26. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor Put your eyes on him. Find ways to think more of him and less of the world in your daily life. F find ways to restrict your phone usage. Our phones can be such a hindrance to our lives. I've told you before, I've gotten to the point now where I'm, I, I have locked out almost every app on my phone. And there's one simple reason for it. Because I found myself years ago to the point that if I had a free moment, do you know what I did? Looking up what? I don't know, something, anything, as long as it was new, as long as it was something. I told you the science, science has said, scientists who worked on the, the, the app for Facebook, and this isn't like weird cuckoo stuff, like this is, this is science that says this, that they found that the reason that you have to pull down to refresh is that it, it simulates the same motion as a slot machine and the rush. Got to have something new, got to have something new. You say, oh, you're making that up. No, no that's, that's from people who designed, for instance, the Facebook app. They all pulled down to refresh. Something new. Come on. Wild, come on. And you know what? We always come up empty. We always come up empty. Put your eyes on Jesus. Restrict phone use, social media, the news, the news. I I'm not saying you shouldn't be informed, but I had to remind you. Listen. Every news outlet has an agenda. Everyone. You know what I want to follow? I want to follow God's agenda. Again, that doesn't mean that you, you, you don't try to find the most uh, newsworthy coverage. The one that tells you the way it, it is, not with the slant. I understand that. What I'm saying is this. We can get so caught up in trying to find the news that that's our God. And I can tell you that's a problem. And I can attest to that. Television viewing, internet usage. Put your eyes on the Lord, not on those things. Again, I'm not saying that those things in and of themselves are wrong. You should know what's going on in the world. It's not inherently sinful to have a smartphone, but we better be careful. Keep our eyes on the Lord. Two, identify yourself willingly with the people of God. Are you willing to identify yourself with other believers? Are you willing to do that? I feel like that's a problem sometimes with believers. Is there's so many that want to be undercover believers. They want to be one thing around, other, uh, around the world, and they want to be another thing at church. Will you identify willingly with the people of God? And another book that I'm reading right now, and this is what came to mind from Ruth, 
Ruth 1, 16 and 17. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And whither thou lodge, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if aught but death part me, thee and me. What did uh, Ruth say to Naomi? That wherever you go, I go. I'm with you. Do we have that attitude with the Lord? Lord, wherever you want me to go, I'm with you. Moab has nothing for me. I just want to be with the people of God. And then three, finally, resolve to live for him every day. Resolve to live for him every day. Joel 2.25, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Some of you may have wasted years in service to God. Some of you may feel like, what can I even do at my age? Or what could I have done with the years that I wasted? Could I give you some encouragement tonight? Stop worrying about those things that are behind and reach to what's before. You can't change what happened back then. Anyone try? You can't. You know what you can work on? Tomorrow. You know what you can work on? This invitation. You know what you can work on? Your next time you get in your Bible. That's what you can work on. Look for those things that are ahead because Satan wants to bring up the past so that he can impact your future. But if you want to look to the past, look back to the cross of Calvary because that's what has the real impact on your future. Thank you for listening to this sermon from the pulpit of Liberty Baptist Church. If this message was a blessing to you or if there's any way we can serve you, please let us know by contacting us at info at mylibertybaptist.org or you can visit us this Sunday at 800 Washington Street in Easton, Massachusetts. May the Lord bless you as you grow in His Word.